Cribs, welcome to Curated Cribs. I'm Cindy Peterson, the Executive Director of the Taubman Museum of Art. And this is our third round. We're so excited. And I see a lot of familiar faces, but I also see a number of, um, of people that I don't know. And I think their number are um, guests of Bill and so, and from different places in the US. And so we started out a little bit more informally as we do these so that, uh, you know, as as we're waiting for people to come in, there can be some informal uh, chatter back and forth, which also makes for interesting conversation before we get started. So I welcome each of you and would love to just kind of um, see who's in the room. We have, you know, Bill, of course, we have a number of artists in our community um, that I see on the screen, as well as a number of our volunteers and um, guests from around the country and um, our leadership, you know, this is for Romeo Beard and uh, lead supporters. Thank you uh, and above as we offer virtual tour series. So thanks each of you for, you know, your continued support of the museum, especially during this time frame as we reinvent ourselves uh, as a museum, as our doors are closed to the public, but continuing to be virtual and bringing art to those uh, in the community as we, as we continue to serve. Uh, all right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and um, we have Bill White with us this evening. And um, Bill, before I do the, t the introduction, would you like to tell us about your favorite signature drink of you and Linda, and then we'll do a toast to get us started, and then I'll go ahead and give background information on okay. Bill. Many so here is our drinks. Uh, I'm drinking Jameson's Irish Whiskey, and Linda is drinking Guinness Stout, uh, and here's my glass. Actually, it's in a little Jameson's glass that I got over there in Ireland. Here's Linda's big glass of stout. Uh, and uh, we had enjoyed uh, when we traveled to uh, Ireland, uh, the opportunity to both try Jameson's at their uh, distillery and the uh, uh, Guinness factory. And Linda decided that she really liked Guinness when she had it fresh there. So ever since we've been trying it here at home in these great cans. So. That's our drink. Cheers. <laughs> Wonderful. Then I would say that, you know, we go ahead and raise a toast to Bill and Linda for joining us here in their home and showing and to everyone on the phone, uh, on the Zoom call. So cheers. And um, we look forward to this evening with Bill and Linda. So Bill White, you know, has been a friend of the museum for many, many years. And uh, I met... I met uh, Bill a number of years ago, um, and he received his BFA from the Philadelphia College of Art and his MFA from the Tyler School of Art from Temple University. Spent 39 years as a professor of painting at Hollins University, uh, and we're very familiar, of course, uh, many of us with, with his work. And Bill, I remember you said, um, that you've been, you were 46 years actually in Roanoke and 39 That's at correct. Hollins, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, exactly. And yeah. you know that the list of accomplishments are, are long and you've received a number of grants and fellowships, the grants from the Cable Mellon and Ford Foundations and in 2012, you were honored with the Kendick Individual Artist Award. Uh, you're a member of the Midwest Paint Group, which I know we'll hear a little bit about that later too. And that was one of the exhibitions we had, um, maybe was, was it 2018 or 17? Yeah, I can't even remember. 18. Uh, 18. 2018. Yeah. So you have a number of works in our permanent collection, which, you know, one hangs outside of my office in the executive director suite, which I told Bill and Linda, you know, I think of them often because I walk by it on a daily basis and it, you know, brings joy to me too, as I see your work in the plein air painting uh, and that view of, of Roanoke. I know you've done a number of residencies, uh, included in, you know, in Paris, France, but also in the Vermont Studio Center. 
Uh, and you've been featured in a number of exhibitions, not only at the Tomlin Museum, but at the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum, uh, the College of William and Mary, Roanoke College, among others. And we worked, you know, closely together on the, on the Jean Helion, uh Painter's Journey in Life and Art in 2013. So it's always, always a joy to, you know, have, have you as part of the art museum, but also personally spending time with you. Well, thank you, Cindy. Uh, yeah, I think my relationship to Roanoke, uh, you know, built up over the decades uh, in relationship to the many iterations that was uh, the pre pre preceding uh, qualities of uh, the Taubman, going back to when it was the Roanoke Fine Arts Center at Cherry Hill, and then uh, when it became the Art Museum of Western Virginia in uh, Center in the Square, and then subsequently to the uh, great uh, new facility that you're in over there uh, at the Taubman. And uh, so it, it's really had a, a long uh, and, and very fruitful history, I think, of uh, myself and uh, Roanoke and the museum, the art community there. I know uh, Jan and Jim and Eric and others uh, <clears throat> there in Roanoke. Uh, we've had a long and, and very productive uh, relationship. Uh, what I wanted to start with is we're here in the gallery, the Village Gallery. Uh, when we moved here in 2016, we ended up buying a building on Main Street that we converted uh, from an old coffee shop into the art gallery uh, <clears throat> with an apartment uh, above uh, that we now live in. And then just last year, we'll be going across the street to my studio building. Uh, uh, and so what we're gonna start with here is, let me see if I can turn this around again. Uh, I'm gonna start with some examples of uh, some of my undergraduate faculty who are very uh, valuable uh, and influential uh, mentors and uh, friends, uh, uh, even after uh, I was in art school. Uh, this is a, an etching by Sidney Goodman a uh, very important uh, figurative painter. Uh, <clears throat> this is a woodcut by Mitzi Melnikoff. This is a drawing by Larry Day. Uh, we had a wonderful exhibition uh, of uh, Larry Day's work at Holland's uh, following the gift from his widow, Ruth Fine. Uh, <clears throat> this is I'll try not to be too much in a reflection. It looks pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a poster uh, by Edna Andrade, uh, who is my color teacher and lifelong friend and, and mentor. Uh, we had uh, an exhibition of hers at Holland's uh, also uh, in years past. Uh, <clears throat> going over here, uh, and these are all things that we've collected over the years. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, these are some pastels by the painter uh, and teacher Louis Finkelstein, uh, whose writings were very helpful and influential to me, uh, not the least of which was his uh, essay called Thoughts on the Painterly. Uh, in 1993, I was going on a sabbatical and uh, we invited as my replacements that year, Sandra Freckleton, whose watercolor you're looking at here, and her husband, Jack Beal. Let me see if I turn it this way, it's a little bit better. Uh, <clears throat> Jack Beal. And uh, Jack and Sandra became uh, uh, very important to Hollins in those early years. This was in 93. And subsequently we ended up uh, getting an endowment that provided for us having a semester long artist in residence program. Here is a painting by George Nick. Uh, and that uh, plaster head in this painting uh, was mine, it's now George's. Uh, and uh, so he did a painting of it and I said, oh man, I really love that painting. So he ended up making a trade, the plaster head for the painting. So I now have the painting of George's. 
I'm going to go around this way. Here is a uh, color lithograph by Marjorie Portnow, uh, <clears throat> who came to Holland's uh, uh, several times, but uh, was also one of our artists in residence. Uh, this is uh, a painting by our first official uh, artist in residence, uh, Jim McGarrell, who sadly just passed away this year. Uh, <clears throat> but this is a type of painting that he called a verso variant. And the reason why he called it that is that if I swap the two pieces, it becomes another composition uh, by being organized uh, <clears throat> as a diptych. And uh, Jim did a number of these, including a very large one that he did during his residency at Holland's. And Bill, Bill, what was yeah. the year on that, if that was the first residency, artist in residence program at Holland's? I believe that was like 1994, I believe. Jan, you might remember, uh, I believe it was around 94, 95 maybe. Uh, and this is a painting by Jillian Peterson Craig, who uh, also does beautiful etchings. Uh, this is an Italian landscape. This is a little study of Stanley Lewis's of the library and the chapel uh, view in Holland's that uh, he did a very large painting that sustained, was sustained over a uh, couple of months that he spent uh, at Holland's with us in 2010, just before I retired. It's a monotype by uh, Barbara Grossman, uh, who a uh, uh, very good friend and uh, wife of Charles Kajori, who also just passed away about a year ago. Wonderful uh, draftsman and painter. This is by Ruth Miller, uh, who's uh, very well known for her still life paintings uh, <clears throat> and was married to Andrew Forge, a uh, very important British painter uh, who was also an important author of books on uh, Monet and Manet, uh, the late paintings, the flower paintings, among others. <clears throat> this is a uh, collage uh, photograph and painting and scratched through the paint by Holly Roberts, uh, <clears throat> a very inventive uh, photographer, uh, collage artist, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Her, her work was always, I think, quite dramatic in these uh, personifications of people that were sometimes like this one across between a bird and a, and a human. This is by Martha Armstrong, uh, also one of our uh, <clears throat> artists in residence. And there's a uh, large painting by Martha that's in the Taubman collection uh, <clears throat> of Alan standing in front of his bicycle, looking across the Holland's campus uh, over to uh, the new library. And there's a very fine, large painting by Jim McGarrell as well in the permanent collection uh, of the Taubman. Now I'm gonna walk towards the back of the, the gallery space and show some examples of the work that I have of uh, Jean Elion. This is a uh, lithograph that uh, was actually made in 1972 uh, from uh, an image uh, that was from 1930. And uh, he did a number of these uh, uh, sort of recreations of some of the earlier abstract creation work uh, in the 70s as prints. Here are two uh, uh, lithographs of newspaper readers, uh, a, a theme that Elion used quite frequently during the, uh, the 1960s. And this is part of a suite that I have of eight lithographs, all of which are variations on this theme. Uh, here's another Jean Elion. This is a combination of charcoal, gouache, and watercolor of pumpkins. Uh, he was very uh, engaged in 
uh, making paintings of pumpkins, the organic quality, these big chunks taken out of it. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the other themes that, uh, and objects that Aelion uh, painted were umbrellas. And you can see the, the pink uh, shape is the umbrella uh, in his studio, the upper section with the golden yellow is out the window uh, <clears throat> and uh, a jacket. Uh, here we have a little seating space, a uh, couple of my works uh, in the gallery. And uh, <clears throat> here we have uh, a piece by Bill Chataway, who was a close friend of Elion's, uh, a British sculptor who worked in Paris uh, his whole career. And uh, we had the privilege of meeting him and going to his studio uh, <clears throat> Uh, when we were there in Paris for our stay at the Cité uh, back in 2010. Uh, this is a small uh, piece that it looks like plaster, but it's actually a, a cast resin piece. So as we look around, there's the front window. And now what I'm going to hopefully do successfully is... I'm Bill. So before we leave the, the um, gallery, could you yes. turn around and kind of show that whole view and maybe talk a little bit about, there we go, that's a great, you know, so if someone comes in, that's what they're seeing in terms of the spacing and talk a little bit about, you know, I'd love to share uh, your and, and Linda's vision of the gallery and I found it so uh, inspiring when you talked about and shared your vision for working with the community and the artists um, in your town and around the region. Yes, uh, when we moved to Caledonia uh, uh, back in 2016, it was because our daughter Heather and her family had relocated here and, uh, you know, it was an 11 hour drive from Roanoke to come and visit and we decided, oh, well, we should come up find a little bungalow or something, have it as a, a, a place we could go. And we ended up buying a storefront building. And then we thought, well, okay, we're gonna open a gallery. What is the plan for the gallery? And I think uh, Linda was very instrumental in our thinking about, well, it should be focused on the community instead of our thinking, okay, well, we know all about what great art is and we're gonna you know, push this on the community, uh, we decided that we would do a lot of things that were oriented towards the community. So we have had uh, many exhibitions during the several years now that focus on members of our regional community, both individual artists uh, with solo shows, as well as then groups and organizations. Uh, we've had uh, uh, quilts, we've had rug hooking, uh, exhibitions. Uh, we've had a show of just nothing but barns uh, as a theme. Uh, we've had a, a plein air painting group. Uh, we were to have this spring, but it got canceled due to COVID. Uh, an encaustic group that's very active up here. Uh, and uh, we will be reopening uh, come September uh, with a, a series of shows uh, each month. Uh, in our first year, we decided that as uh, we would close the, the season with a community show. So we had a, uh, a non-juried exhibition where people could just pay a $10 entry fee and they submitted work and we hung everything we got. First year, we had about 45 pieces. The next year, we had 90 pieces, uh, filled the place quite the... Uh, the floor to ceiling almost. Uh, and that's been a very successful event. And that's our November to mid-December event. Uh, and what we do there in addition uh, to having it be an open juried uh, exhibition is we give a prize for the piece we think is the most uh, important uh, artistically. And then we encourage people to, who come into the show to make a people's choice uh, vote uh, and it's always been very interesting to see uh, uh, families that come in with children. The kids tend to know exactly what piece they like, go right to it, get the name, put the name in the box. And the parents are saying, 
oh, can I only have one? Oh, I really like these three. Can I vote for all three? I say, no, you got to do just what your little kids did, was pick it and put it in a box. So uh, but we've had a very successful uh, series of exhibitions, and they've been very warmly received uh, by the community here in uh, the village. Uh, the opening evenings that we've done first Friday events uh, to the start of the shows, and those have been very popular, uh, frequently standing room only uh, as we get uh, into the uh, uh, evening uh, for the exhibitions uh, each month. Uh, congratulations to both you and Linda. I mean, you know, putting together that, you know, uh, the, the community show with, you know, so much involvement and interest, but also, you know, I remember you said you change the exhibitions if it's a solo or the community on a monthly basis. So that's, you know, right. uh, you know, a lot of traffic that you're getting in and pulling in 40 to 60 people for a first Friday. We all know that that takes a lot, you know, that's a, that yep. really shows the need in the community too. And, um, you know, Bill, what's the next gallery within, you know, driving distance from where you're at? I think that tells a story, too, of where, you know, where visitors are coming from. Uh, I think Geneseo, which is about a 20-mile uh, distance, is the closest uh, gallery. It's also the University uh, SUNY Geneseo uh, community. And then we're about 35 minutes drive south of Rochester, where the Memorial Art Gallery and the George Eastman House are located. And there are a number of gallery buildings there, some large uh, industrial spaces that have been converted into gallery and studio spaces, Anderson Alley and the Hungerford Building up there. But we're, we are uh, certainly the only game in town for quite a distance around us. But, uh, and, and we've been drawing people from Rochester, Buffalo, uh, elsewhere uh, uh, too. And, and you've combined not only your gallery, but also your living quarters, and then you have also kind of a bed and breakfast Airbnb, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, wow. we're gonna head across the street now. I hope this Wonderful. stays with us. Uh, I'll give you a little sense of the community and we'll get over into the studio building, which is uh, just diagonally across the street, Main Street from us. So here we go. Here's our main street. It's our daughter's shop, Mastique, next door. Casablanca, that's our front door. And here's the, the gallery. Let me back up and we'll give you a fuller view of We're heading over to the kind of celadon green building across the street. So this building is really a composite of several additions. So we're, uh, we're in right now is the original stone core of the building. And you can see over here the, ex the interior wall that has the stone uh, in it. Uh, we took down some walls. Uh, the building was built in 1826 uh, and it was originally a uh, blacksmith shop and wheelwright and uh, <clears throat> burned down at one point, was rebuilt and uh, uh, this building had been for a good part of the 20th century a uh, printing press and it did the uh, local newspaper and other uh, things, uh, but it was largely the, the regional newspaper. Uh, and then its uh, last incarnation was as a pet shop uh, right when we bought it. Uh, so what I'm gonna show you now is a series of, a series of paintings that are recent and these are based on the uh, uh, front space, the bay window area with two chairs in our apartment upstairs over the gallery. And it's related to the painting from 
1993, the studio light suite that's in the museum. And so this series of paintings, trying to get it so the don't get too much glare. These are all 12 by 12 inch paintings. Uh, and like the original series, it's all about sort of how the light uh, articulates and moves through that space. Uh, and each experience is quite unique, how it, you know, creates a pattern. Some are more somber, some are more colorful, uh, depending on the light that's coming into the space uh, and how I'm sort of composing the pictures. Uh, here are a couple of things from, or we made a trip to Cuba uh, in January uh, and we're there about two weeks. And so the views of uh, Old Havana, uh, a view in an area outside of Havana, out in the countryside, uh, the mountains are these kind of lumpy bumps called megotes. And of course, the uh, marvelous old cars that they've been able to keep running miraculously since the 50s. Uh, and many of them have been repainted uh, into a, a bright kind of Pepto-Bismol pink. Uh, so this space is where I work. Uh, I've got a little computer station. Uh, here's my paint table, all my colors, all of my many, many brushes, my many palette knives. I've been doing a lot with palette knife lately. Here's, for those of you who know my obsession with brushes, will remember brushes, 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 can never have enough brushes. Uh, and here in uh, this area, <clears throat> there's another painting from the Cuba trip looking back over Havana. Uh, uh, I've joined a couple of the art organizations here in our area. One is called the Genesee Valley Plein Air Painters. Uh, 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 it's an informal, uh, larger group of people from novices to professionals. And uh, we go out and paint together. They have paint out events. Uh, but I've also joined a group called the All Weather Gang. And it's been in existence for about 40 years. And uh, these folks uh, go out every Saturday throughout the year, snow, summertime, fall, spring, evening, you know, uh, places that are, this is a view of a, a little waterfalls in Leroy. Uh, and so we go out, uh, gather together about nine o'clock on a Saturday morning for breakfast. So instead of being Sunday painters, we're Saturday painters. Uh, and we go out and paint uh, together. Uh, I tend to like a bigger size. These are all 22 by 28 oil on canvas, but uh, most of the other folks are uh, painting at a much smaller scale. Uh, <clears throat> I have a little cleanup station, a little table to sit at, and then let me walk back through. This is now the uh, end of the original building, and we're going into a space that was built right after World War II, and it's effectively uh, my art library, and I'll turn around here without giving you vertigo. So, brought my art library with me. I've got all kinds of literature, because for 35 years or so, I taught uh, art history, and so uh, uh, contemporary criticism and 
20th century artists. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got a lot of books and a whole section back here in this brown case is uh, art catalogs from exhibitions that uh, have always proved very valuable to help the students. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that <clears throat> I've done over the years is to collect hands. And this kind of started it off. Uh, these are some plaster casts of hands that I got when my uh, undergraduate school, uh, Philadelphia College of Art, were uh, in the early 60s throwing away all of the plaster casts, thinking, oh, that's old school. We can't do that anymore. And so, uh, <clears throat> Actually, this is a combination work of Janet Newald and David Crane. They worked together. Uh, David made the plate. Janet did the figure painting on it. Uh, <clears throat> this wooden hand actually holds a wine bottle. It was something we got in Cuba this year. Uh, this little figure is something that I got from my colleague, Francis Nieder, who taught at Hollands for decades. Uh, Mimi Bay Paris sculpture. <clears throat> I had to leave my big plant back in Virginia, so I've got another one and it's growing like bunkers here uh, in this space. And more hands. This large white thing is interesting, it's a mold for making latex gloves. They would uh, <clears throat> make these and then dip it in. Uh, you can see like this little set of rings. Uh, the thing would go along on an automated system, dip into the latex, uh, move along the conveyor belt and eventually be pulled off. Uh, <clears throat> here's a sculpture by Kurt, uh, whose last name I'm blanking right now. I think I've got it. Kurt Steger, this is a maquette for a public sculpture that he did uh, in California, a large uh, public sculpture. And this is uh, Betty's uh, dancing figure of which the large uh, carved marble piece is in the museum collection. Uh, it's a piece we've always admired and used to have it in the apartment all the time and I've moved it over here so I can see it every day when I'm in the studio. Uh, last, uh, let's say in 2016, uh, before we moved, we had made a trip out west to go to the, some of the national parks uh, on a trip following uh, going to a friend's wedding in Phoenix. And uh, so lately I've been doing these paintings as kind of uh, a way of remembering that experience of a very unusual landscape out in the West. Uh, <clears throat> these are larger. These are, uh, I think this one's about 38 by 40. This one is from the Grand Canyon. This is uh, about uh, 40 by 42, something like that. So. And Bill, Bill, in terms of, you know, painting from, you know, usually most of your paintings are when you're, you know, actually there. So tell us about kind of that journey to, you know, not, you know, being there at the national right. parks right now. Right, right. Uh, yeah, normally I paint uh, pretty exclusively from direct observation. There's something about that immediacy that, uh, has always been important to me. And uh, in this case, uh, I'm not out there painting in the landscape, but painting from photographs that both Lynn and I took as we were out there uh, before. Uh, and uh, what I've been finding is that uh, the photographs provide a kind of a prompt of memory. So I'll begin uh, with a drawing uh, loosely on the canvas uh, from the photograph, uh, blocking in uh, some color. Uh, and then basically the photograph goes away 
and I'm painting uh, kind of from memory and I guess you could probably say uh, imagination, uh, <clears throat> uh, what it uh, felt like, uh, what I think the painting needs and as a result, uh, these paintings are more, uh, I would say, bold and somewhat more uh, simplified as abstractions of a sort in terms of how the paint is handled. Uh, I'll move in a little bit on some of these. That you can see that uh, the paint is much more uh, roughly handled in sections uh, as well. Uh, I've been using, this one's exclusively, I think pretty exclusively palette knife. And so as a result, uh, the, uh, uh, the form, uh, the way things move, uh, the uh, sort of thrust and counter thrust uh, is uh, 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 made more dramatic uh, than maybe it would be if I was there painting directly uh, and, and thinking about just all of the individual uh, sensations that I was getting. I don't know if that helps. Uh, what, uh, what, what Linda did actually on this little painting uh, is we have a, uh, a, a little uh, video that uh, we made that was kind of, uh, I guess you call it time lapse, uh, so that uh, in about a 10 minute uh, view, you can see how this painting went from start to finish, uh, and it's on our website. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be doing with a friend, uh, Dave Esposito and uh, Jillian Peterson Craig, uh, <clears throat> kind of collaborating on uh, my doing a painting uh, <clears throat> from start to finish that'll be uh, kind of to show how I work. Uh, and once when I'm painting, I can't really talk about it. I was never one of those sort of demonstrators of painting that could say, Oh, you know, this is funny. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, I know Eric is very good at being able to do that. Uh, he's got that capacity and skill and personality temperament. Uh, I'm the opposite. I, I kind of go into a little, you know, kind of shell uh, and have just, you know, it's all very internalized. So I can't chit chat. So what we're hoping is that if we do this uh, and do the, the study uh, in, the, in the time lapse, and then it gets edited down some, and I can do some voiceover, uh, I'll be able to uh, share a little bit more about how I work and what I'm thinking of. When Linda had done uh, one of these paintings, I think it was uh, this one, I think was the one she did in time lapse. Uh, uh, she said, I can't believe it's like, doesn't look like anything. It's just abstract and, all these movements and shapes and color dabs, and then it turned out to look like that when we were done. But, uh, and because I'm in the midst of all of this, let me see if I can turn this around now. There we go, there we go. Uh, so it's, it, it was a revolution, rev, yeah, revolution, revelation to me to see that uh, uh, video because I'm seeing myself making choices that I'm not really conscious of making and seeing myself working like that. Uh, I began to realize there are things that I'm doing that I'm not uh, conscious of at the moment, but that are part of the sort of action and reaction, the building up of uh, imagery elements. And, and I know that for my colleagues like Jan and Jim and Eric and, and others who are uh, painters, that, that that's something that they understand too, that, you know, there are many things that we do in the process of making our work that are not conscious thoughts. They're not part of a plan. Uh, and so uh, that is kind of what I found very helpful in seeing it myself. 